<laughs> Welcome to your lecture on tissues. Well, not these kinds of tissues, right? Of course, these kinds of tissues. The tissues that make up you and the tissues that make up me. And these tissues are very diverse. And we're going to spend this lecture trying to break down all the different kinds of tissues that make up the human body. Now, this lecture is going to be kind of long because there's a lot of them. So no prob, right? Because this is an online lecture. That means you can pause it and rewind it and play it and pause it and rewind it and play it as much as you want. So pace yourself, spread it out, right? Well, turns out there's lots of different kinds of tissues. So let's take a look at the nature of these tissues. Well, first of all, our body has a lot of cells, right? With the exception of some other materials, we're mostly cells. And in fact, there's about 75 trillion cells making you up. 75 trillion, just put that in perspective of the national debt. Anyway, we can take all these cells and say, okay, how do these cells work together to make an organism function? And it turns out that if you have a group of cells, they might be diverse cells, and they're all working together for a common function, we call that a tissue. Not this kind of tissue, the tissues that make up our body. Now, they're very diverse, and we can organize them into basically four categories. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so again, a tissue is a group of cells performing similar functions. There's outside material called an extracellular matrix. But So let's see what we got here. We have muscle tissue. You know, most muscles that you think about, you know, like your biceps or your triceps or your quadriceps, those are muscles you can work out at the gym. Those are our skeletal muscles. They're under your conscious, voluntary control. But you also have muscle tissue in the body that is not under voluntary control. So, for example, you have what's called smooth muscle. And that smooth muscle is lining your blood vessels. It's in your intestine. These are things that help natural processes to occur in the body, but they do it automatically. It's like autopilot. You're not consciously thinking about it. And you have cardiac muscle, which, you know, makes up your heart. So we'll talk uh, more about these different kinds of muscle tissues. And of course, later in the semester, we're going to go hardcore into muscle and you'll be learning all the parts of at the cellular level of muscles. And of course, you'll be learning all the muscles. Ah, stay tuned for that. That's always fun. Uh, well, let's see what other kinds of things you have here. You have nervous tissue. So if I can get my little pointer here. Nervous tissue is obviously tissue associated with the nervous system. So let's come over here. So we just talked about muscle tissue. So that's one of the four types. But then we have nervous tissue. And so obviously you have nervous tissue in your brain. You have nervous tissue running throughout your body that contains your nerve cells. And, uh, you know, especially in the later parts of anatomy physiology, you get into all the nitty gritties of the cells that make up nervous tissue. Uh, the first topic we're going to talk today is about epithelial tissue. And it's one of my favorites because it's so much fun to look at under a microscope. And if you take anatomy and physiology lab, you will spend a lot of time looking at epithelial tissue under a microscope. So um, that will be what we tackle first. So, of course, keeping with our little schematic here, let's circle our epithelial tissue. And we have connective tissue. And so here's a picture of one type of connective tissue. But with all of these categories, particularly with the connective tissue and the epithelial tissue, you're going to find that these are very broad categories. Because I know you're sitting there like, ah, four types of tissue, connective tissue, epithelial tissue, muscle tissue, nervous tissue. I can, I can dig that. I can memorize that. Well, turns out there's a lot of subcategories in, in each of those especially epithelial tissue and connective tissue. So we're going to try to break those down and learn the different subcategories and in some cases sub subcategories and try to keep it all straight in our head. Uh, but the real challenge is once you've learned this stuff, not just knowing these categories, but being able to, to understand what kind of tissue you'll find in different parts of the body. So for example, in your trachea, what kind of epithelial tissue lines your trachea, your windpipe? Huh. And it turns out, just like anything in A&P, form follows function, or function follows form, in the sense that the form will dictate what kind of functions can come out of that. 
but the function, the need for that particular structure will help guide the evolution of that structure over time. So anyway, uh, we're going to be looking at both the structure and the function of some of these tissues. So let's get started. So let's start off with epithelial tissue. And I have over here some different pictures of epithelial tissue. And my goal is by the end of this talk on epithelial tissue, you'll be able to pick a slide. Maybe you go to Google Images and you Google epithelial tissue and it'll show you a bunch of different pictures. You should be able to tell me what kind of epithelial cells are making up that tissue. And it's actually really fun. It's, it's like a game. So epithelial tissue. Well, let's take a look at some of the root words here. So let's look at this beginning of this word, epi. Now you'll see the, uh, the prefix epi a lot in anatomy and physiology. Um, if you've studied the body regions, for example, you might recall the epigastric region, which means upon the belly region. Um, so if you learn these prefixes, and in some cases suffixes, um, early on, it will really help you as you go through your anatomy and physiology studies because you'll be able to be like, oh yeah, I remember that means upon, or that means to the side, or that means below, and it'll just make it that much easier to learn these things. So epithelial tissue is tissue that lies upon another kind of tissue. Um, and this kind of tissue lines every body surface and all body cavities. So this is really interesting, actually. So if you think of all of your blood vessels, they're lined on the inside and on the outside of the tubes with epithelial cells. So one way you could think of epithelial tissue is that it's always facing some kind of space. So uh, if you draw like a little tube here, I'm going to draw a little tube down here, and Okay, I'm really horrible at drawing, especially with an electronic pen, but you get the idea. So imagine this is a tube. It's a blood vessel, or it's a digestive tract, or it's your trachea. It's some kind of tube. There's always a space inside that tube, and then outside of that tube is also some kind of space. Maybe it has fluid in it, but it's open to some other part of the body. Now that space that goes inside of a tube is called the lumen. So anytime you hear the word lumen, it means space. And so why would we want a bunch of epithelial tissue lining the inside of our tubes and the outside of our tubes? Well, it has to do with the function of the epithelial tissue. It actually, epithelial tissue has a lot of functions, very, very important functions. But let's take a look at this slide right here, this little picture. Um, we're going to learn in just a little bit um, the kind of epithelial tissue that we're looking at, but right away you know that you're looking at a cross section of a tube because bum, ba, rum, we have a lumen. So I am actually going to change my pen color for this just to make it a little bit easier here. Boop. Okay, and I'm going to write in this space lumen. Okay, so that's my lumen. And then, of course, outside of this tube, so you can see that the edge of the tube there is, looks like it's packed with other cells, but nonetheless, it's kind of a space. It's some other thing going on. And so all these cells packed in here are epithelial cells, and together they form epithelial tissue. And over here, these are epithelial cells. Let's, let's change colors again, and so here's one epithelial cell. Here's another epithelial cell, and notice that each one has a nucleus. Um, so these are epithelial cells here, and then up here we have yet another micrograph, and this is a different kind of epithelial tissue layer, and each of these cells is actually kind of long, and they're all packed tightly together. So this is characteristics of epithelial tissue. These cells are jam-packed in together. So it's kind of like if you had, if you had chest pieces, so these are pawns if you've ever played chess. These guys are all lined up really close together. They're kind of forming a barrier, right? They're like little soldiers lined up. They're very cool. And as you can see just from these pictures, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. But they all serve very, very important functions for the body.
So let's take a look at some of these functions. Number one, epithelial tissue can play a function in protection. Very, very important, right? Because our bodies are constantly under attack. I mean, it's like a war zone there. We have pathogens trying to get in. We have chemicals from the environment, toxins trying to get in our body. And of course, um, our skin, which we'll be learning more about the skin very soon, it is lined with an epithelium as well. It's lined with epithelial tissue. And all that is, is on the outside, it's these layers of cells, these, these kind of soldiers lined up. And so because these cells are so tightly packed together, they're forming a barrier. They're kind of like locking arms. And that's going to allow only the things we want inside of our cells. So water, for example, or nutrients. Like if you're talking about the epithelial layer of your intestine, you want to be able to absorb nutrients into there. Um, but if you're talking about bacteria, you don't want those in. So these guys actually can protect us and help to determine what can go in and what can't go in. And so that property of determining, you know, taking in the good stuff and keeping out the bad stuff, we can call that selective permeability. That means that it's selective in what can permeate, <laughs> penetrate through that epithelial cell layer um, and into the lumen or into your body. So epithelial tissue, it serves for protection. It allows good things in and bad things to stay out. And in some cases, in most cases, epithelial tissue can have secretions. So what that means is the individual cells making up the epithelial tissue actually can produce something. So uh, let's take an example. Let's, let's draw a typical epithelial cell here. And as you'll learn in a minute, they come in different shapes and sizes, but I'm gonna do a nice simple one. Let's say this guy looks like a cube. And they actually, in many cases, have some kind of little projections at one end. Um, and of course, let's draw the nucleus. You can't forget the nucleus. So these guys will be kind of your first line of defense. Um, and, you know, maybe this is we're looking at the inside of an intestine. So there might be another set of epithelial cells facing on the other side, the space in the middle. Well, in the case of, let's say that we're talking about the cells inside the intestine, the epithelial cells, this guy will actually produce something called mucin. Oh, that does not look like a U, does it? Mucin. Mucin, when combined with water, makes mucus. And so these little mucin particles that are being produced will make their way out in, of the cell and into the lumen. And when you get all these cells doing that at the same time, they're serving a common purpose, you get this nice layer of mucus lining your intestines smooth move, right? You, you want that to happen because that helps all the stuff that you're digesting to make, make its way through there. So, um, anyway, physical protection, selective permeability, and secretions. Ooh, and then we got epithelial cells that have sensations. So think of your skin. You know, if I start going like this, I get all goosebumpy, right? So you actually have, um, the ability for these epithelial tissues to kind of register what's going on in the environment. They actually have sensation. They're tied into the nervous system and, and therefore they can sort of determine, is this a good feeling? Is this a bad feeling? If my epithelial cells hit a, a hot stove, you know, that doesn't feel so good. Take a look at, at this right here. This is a picture of a cross section, some kind of tube, maybe this See how this looks all weird and funky here? That is the lumen. It's just there's nothing inside to kind of expand it. So that is a collapsed lumen right there. Whereas this one has more rigid um, walls to this tube. And so the lumen is nice and big. But you get the general idea. Okay, so again, let's take a closer look at an epithelial cell because it turns out different parts of the cell have different names. So, um, what you have here is actually a cross section of tissue that includes the epithelial tissue along with the other stuff. So let's take a look at what all this stuff is. And because this is light, I'm going to change my ink color here. Let's go back to a nice blue. All right, so we're looking at some generalized um, epithelial cell here. And notice from here, you know, et cetera, this is my nice sheet of 
epithelial cells. So notice they each have a nucleus. Notice they're really tightly packed together. Ooh, there we go, and that one's tightly packed right there. And they each have a nucleus. Um, but notice also that they kind of all line up in the same place at the bottom. Okay, that's important. That is what's called the basal surface, or sometimes called the basal lateral surface. So that's the basal surface, and there's actually tissue, tissue there, not tissue, but there's a substance there that's made up of proteins and complex sugars called polysaccharides, and that is called the basement membrane. So the basement membrane is a material that is going to connect that epithelial tissue layer to the underlying layer of tissue, which is connective tissue. And again, we'll get into the different kinds of connective tissue later in the lecture. Now, if the basal surface of these cells are connected to the basement membrane, what about the other side? So we already said, you know, the lumen is out here, whatever kind of lumen it is. And we said these guys are selectively permeable. So what that means is one side of the epithelial tissue layer is able to control what goes in and out, while the other one is just stuck there to the basement membrane. And it turns out the uh, side of the cells that does the choosing of what goes in and out is called the apical surface. So that's kind of a general term for the top part. And uh, if to our generalized picture of one kind of epithelial cell, okay, so this is epithelial cell, um, you know, this part right here would be the basal membrane and this part would be the apical surface. And so again, stuff can come in and out there. Okay, so we talked about the apical surface and the basal surface. Here's another characteristic of epithelial cells. They are avascular. A means not, right? So vascular refers to blood vessels. So epithelial tissue is avascular. It has avascularity. So there is no blood supply to the epithelial layer. And so you're like, okay, what do we know about blood? Blood is good, right, because it delivers oxygen, it delivers nutrients, takes away the bad stuff, the waste. So how do these epithelial cells stay alive when there's no blood vessels to give them what they need? Well, think back to some of your general biology concepts here, and you might remember, let's see if I can redraw that generalized epithelial cell. It gets worse every time, huh? You might remember that there was a process that you learned about in general biology concepts called diffusion. Remember diffusion? Wow, that is a really bad diffusion. Let's do that again. U-S-I-O-N. Diffusion. And osmosis is diffusion of water. So if you remember the process of diffusion, molecules go from an area where they're highly concentrated to an area where they're less concentrated. So if there's a higher concentration of some nutrient the cell needs in the blood or in the uh, fluid surrounding the cells, it's going to, by the process of diffusion, diffuse across the apical surface into the cell, inside the cell. And likewise, if it's something else, like let's say there's a bunch of waste products, let's say there's a bunch of waste products inside of the cell, you know, from products of metabolism, those guys are more concentrated inside than outside, so they're going to go outside of the cell. So that's the process of diffusion, okay, rewrote diffusion there for you because I couldn't stand my own electronic pen handwriting. Okay, so, so epithelial cells, instead of having to depend on a vascular supply of nutrients and removal of waste, they use the process of diffusion to move nutrients and waste in and out of the cell through the apical surface. Keep that in mind. Stuff's going only through the apical surface. Now, now the good thing is that these cells are so tightly packed together that this helps with that protective barrier and that selective permeability. The only way that things can go in and out of the cell is through the apical surface. So it's so important that these cells are very, oops, very tightly packed together because that means that there's only one way in and one way out. Things have to go through this apical surface and that really helps to protect things and make sure that 
there's selective permeability. The cells can choose what they want to go in or out, and stuff's not going to just leak through the sides. Okay, so here's another property. Epithelial cells regenerate fast. That means they undergo lots of mitosis. Mitosis. Cell division, cell reproduction, right? This is how new cells create baby cells. And think of it, it's really important. If you had a laceration to your skin, you want your skin epithelial cells to grow back really, really fast. Um, and certainly if you had um, a problem with uh, the epithelial lining of your intestine or your trachea, you'd want that to heal very fast. So epithelial tissue does um, regenerate itself very, very quickly. Okay, so we're opening up AP Revealed. You remember AP Revealed, right? And not only is it going to be great for studying muscles and bones and things like that, but pretty much anything in AMP. And so let's take a look at the module on tissues. So if we pull down tissues, um, you'll see that for the tissues lesson, uh, we, you can click on the film link and on the histology link, and of course you got self quizzes. So if we click on the film link, make sure you click all content, and you'll see an uh, epithelial tissue overview. So let's take an overview of this, and it's going to talk about the different categories and subcategories of epithelial tissue, then we're going to recap it. So here we go. Epithelia form the surface layer of the body line body cavities, hollow organs, and structures, and constitute most gland tissue. Any substance that enters or leaves the body must cross an epithelium. All epithelia consist of one or more layers of tightly packed cells and little or no extracellular matrix between cells. Distinguishing features of an epithelium include a free apical surface and a fixed basal surface. Specialized intercellular junctions join adjacent cells, and a thin basement membrane separates the basal surface from underlying connective tissue layers. Although epithelia lack blood vessels, many sensory nerve endings are present. Epithelia have a high regenerative capacity that allows them to maintain their function. The primary functions of an epithelium are to resist dehydration and injury from physical, chemical, and biological agents, to selectively regulate materials entering and leaving the body, to secrete products produced by epithelial glands, and to monitor the environment through specialized sensory nerve endings and specialized epithelial cells. Epithelial tissues are classified using two basic criteria the number of cell layers, and the shape of the cell at the apical surface. An epithelium composed of one layer of cells is termed simple. If there are two or more layers of cells, the epithelium is termed stratified. When the apical cells are flat and thin, the epithelium is classified as squamous. Apical cells that are somewhat square shape belong to a cuboidal classification while those with a rectangular shape are termed columnar. By combining the criteria of cell shape and number of layers, all epithelia can be classified easily. For example, a simple squamous epithelium is composed of a single layer of thin, flat cells. In contrast, a stratified squamous epithelium is composed of multiple layers of cells, with the apical surface layer being thin and flat. These same tenets could be applied to cuboidal and columnar epithelia. There are two special types of epithelia. Transitional epithelium found in the urinary tract is a stratified epithelium that gives the impression of transitioning from cuboidal when the epithelium is relaxed to squamous when it is stretched. A pseudostratified epithelium found in the trachea, for example, is a simple epithelium in which all cells contact the basal lamina, but only some reach the apical surface. Cells are of varying heights, and their nuclei are at different positions in the epithelium, giving the impression of stratification. Some epithelial classes have specializations of the free surface of apical cells. Simple columnar epithelial cells in some organs have cilia, which are small, finger-like multiple projections. 
Thus, simple columnar epithelium is subclassified as ciliated or non-ciliated. In parts of the digestive and urinary tracts, epithelial cells involved in absorption have a dense collection of short cytoplasmic processes called microvilli on their free surface. Microvilli are non-motile and serve to increase surface area. Because the microvilli appear fuzzy in the light microscope, cells with numerous microvilli are said to have a brush border. A stratified squamous epithelium has either dead or living cells as the surface layer. The dead cells contain the protein keratin. Therefore, stratified squamous epithelium is subclassified as keratinized or non-keratinized. Epithelial cells are tightly connected to adjacent cells by specializations called intercellular junctions. There are four types of junctions. Tight junctions, adhering junctions, desmosomes, and gap junctions. Tight junctions, also known as zonula occludens, are bands of fused cell membrane near the free surface of adjacent epithelial cells. These junctions attach a cell to its neighbors, encircling cells and sealing the space between them. Thus, substances crossing the epithelium must pass through epithelial cells, not between them. Tight junctions are essential to the primary function of an epithelium, which is to regulate substances that enter and leave the body. Adhering junctions, also known as zonula adherens, have a similar band-like arrangement seen in tight junctions. They are located deep to the tight junctions and have numerous microfilament proteins from the cytoplasm that act as anchors for adjacent cells. There is a small gap between the cell membranes of adjacent cells at adhering junctions. Desmosomes, also known as macula adherens, are small button or snap-like junctions. These form at the points of mechanical stress. They are different from tight and adhering junctions in that they do not encircle the entire cell. Gap junctions are points where small pores connect the cytoplasm of adjacent cells. The gap junction consists of a series of hollow bridging structures called connexons. Small solutes, such as ions, glucose, and amino acids, pass through connexons from the cytoplasm of one cell into a neighboring cell. Okay, how cool was that? You can see AP Revealed can be your best friend. So um, before we get into the different categories and subcategories um, of, of epithelial cells that you just saw in the video, let's uh, touch again on the intracellular junctions that it was just mentioning. So we said already that epithelial cells are bound tightly together on their lateral surfaces on the side. And if you look at this diagram right here, it kind of does a really good example of a simple example of showing exactly what's going on along that lateral border between two epithelial cells. So here's one and here's another. And you might recall from the video, they mentioned four main um, types of intracellular junctions, tight junctions, adhering junctions, desmosomes, and gap. And so let's, uh, let's look at the tight junctions here and just recap that. So here is Mr. Bad Guy. Uh, that is some bacterial cell or some toxin, something we don't want in. We do not want him penetrating down the sides of um, these cells and because then it would enter possibly uh, the connective tissue and get into our bloodstream. So uh, you tend to, towards the top, have tight junctions, which actually go all the way around the cell. And these are uh, projections of the cell membranes themselves, and they're just stuck together really, really tightly, and nothing is getting through that. Um, further down, you might have an adhering um, kind of intracellular junction. So here it's called an adhesion belt because it also goes around the cell. And you can see that this is kind of similar. Uh, the membranes are coming together pretty closely, but there's also proteins that are going to kind of connect them together. So it kind of makes a loose structure, and that allows a few things to transfer between the two cells, not too much. 
Um, the third type are the desmosomes, and for these guys, there's a much looser connection, uh, so more stuff can transport through there. And then finally, the gap junctions, which are themselves tight together, but as you saw in the video, they are bridged by connexons, and connexons are actually proteins. You'll, you'll get this kind of trend all the time at the cellular level. It's all about proteins. Proteins, 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 stuck in the cell membrane doing all sorts of things. Well, in this case, these connexon proteins are um, stuck into these gap junctions, and that way they're kind of like little pores, and it, things can go in or out, but only through those pores. It's kind of like, like directing traffic, if you will. So anyway, uh, just to let you know that even though our epithelial layer is, looks like it's a bunch of soldiers, thousands of soldiers lined up together, and even though the apical surface may let stuff in and out, the, um, the bulk of the cells really tight together, yet communication is still going on between those cells. And in fact, it's fascinating to study. So for example, the epithelial layer in your heart They've actually done studies where you can take heart cells um, from one heart and heart cells from another heart and you put them in a petri dish together under the right nutrient conditions, ambient conditions. And when these guys come together, they will form these intercellular junctions and electrical communication, chemical communications going between these guys and they'll actually start feeding together. I kid you not. Tell that to your friends at the dinner table. Okay, so let's recap what was gone over in the video about the different categories and types of epithelial tissue layers. And I've given you yet another bunch of pretty pictures to ponder here. But you'll remember that there's kind of two main categories. You have the um, how many layers of cells you're dealing with. So let's actually write that down. The number of layers, that determines one type. Layers. Layers. And uh, the other category is the shape. So talking about the layers specifically, you can basically break this down into two types. We have simple epithelium and we have stratified epithelium. So let's start with simple epithelium. Simple epithelium is very simple. It consists of just one layer of cells. So for example, uh, you see here, this is a simple layer of epithelial cells, they're all just lined up, there's just one layer, um, all lined up and touching the basal membrane, and then here's your apical surfaces over here. Um, here is a picture of cells that are also in a simple layer structure, just one cell layer thick. So for example, the cheek cells, uh, the epithelial cells lining your inside your cheek are one layer thick, so they are simple in, in that sense. Now, the opposite of simple is stratified, and this would be two or more layers of epithelial cells kind of stacked on top of each other. So if we look at this picture right here, notice that there's a layer here, and then there's a layer here, and a layer here, et cetera. So there's multiple layers of those cells, and that makes them what we call stratified. So simple epithelium tends to um, be found in areas where there's a necessity for transport. So for example, the lining of blood vessels, you know, you got to transport blood or, um, you know, areas that have saliva, things like that. So you tend to have transport functions for simple epithelium, whereas stratified are found in areas where protection is a major thing that you got to worry about. So for example, your palms and the soles of your feet, you want that to be nice, thick epithelial tissue um, because there's a lot of stress, you got a lot of ickies in the environment you got to worry about, and so you have stratified epithelium. Okay, so that's the number of tissue layers, so simple versus stratified. And then, um, oh, and here's a third category I almost forgot to mention, yet how could we forget this? Pseudo-stratified, and of course you know that pseudo means, eh, it means quasi, right? So pseudo-stratified, it's called pseudo-stratified because it's actually simple, it's one cell layer thick, but under a microscope, it kind of looks like there's multiple layers, but there's actually not. So if you can see this picture right here, and I hope my face isn't covering it, um, this is an epithelial layer turned on its side, and right along here is the basement membrane, 
Over here is the epical surface, and uh, you'll notice that this is ciliated because there's all these little cilia here. Um, so this is probably from the trachea. And um, notice that even though the nuclei of these cells, you know, like this cell, the nucleus is up here, down there, it's down there, et cetera, makes it look like it's stratified, right? It kind of looks like something like this. But if you actually look really closely under a scope, you'll notice that the basal uh, side, the basal lateral side of these cells all touch that basement membrane. So even though the nuclei are positioned in weird places and not all of the cells touch the apical surface, they all do touch the basement membrane, the basal surface, and therefore they're simple, but they look like they're stratified, therefore we call it pseudostratified. So that kind of tissue is common in the respiratory system, the trachea. Now let's go to that second category, and that second category is shapes. So epithelial cells come in different shapes, and here they are. We got squamous, or squamous if you prefer, cuboidal, and columnar. Now, squamous, think of the word squash, right? If you squash something, you make it flatter. So squamous cells are flattened cells. So when, when you look at them from the side, they're going to look something like this. Now, when you look at them from the top, you know, let's say you did a cross section, then they're going to just look like something like this. So if you look at this diagram, it's actually good at kind of illustrating what I'm talking about. So a sagittal section or a longitudinal section, imagine these are your cheek cells because those are simple squamous. Um, cross section makes it look flat like that, but a longitudinal section, you're basically just getting it flat like that, like it's been squashed. Okay, so that's one type. Flat cells are squamous cells. Cube-shaped cells, so I'm just going to draw it kind of something like this, and sometimes it's not perfect cube, but cube-shaped cells like you see here, these are, and I know that my head's in the way for that one, so I will do this one. So these cube-shaped cells are called cuboidal, and cells that kind of have more of a column shape are columnar. Makes sense, right? Squamous flat, cuboidal cube, columnar are tall cells. Um, now, there's also a kind of cell that's often stuck in between these uh, columnar cells, and these are called goblet cells. And these are cells that specifically produce mucin, which becomes mucus. So take a look at this one up here. So each of these little cells, this is a columnar epithelial layer, that's one columnar cell, and right here, is a special type of columnar cell called a goblet cell. So I'm going to go ahead and label that as goblet, goblet, goblet cell. Okay, so squamous cuboidal columnar. So when you're actually describing epithelial tissue, you need both of those categories. How many layers is it and what shape is it? And so we have simple squamous, like the lining inside your cheeks. We have simple cuboidal, like, um, like you see these cells lining a particular vessel here. So don't forget the inside space is the lumen, and then here's the outside. This is a cross section. And columnar cells, like you find in the intestine. Okay, so this would be an intestinal uh, simple columnar epithelium. Um, and there's one more type that we need to talk about that kind of doesn't fit any of those things. And this is called transitional epithelium. So you saw this in the video. Transitional epithelium is found in the urinary tract, like your bladder, places where you need to stretch. So your bladder, as we all know, when it fills up with fluid, with urine, it stretches. And so the cells that make up the epithelial lining inside and outside of that bladder themselves stretch. And so you go from something that when your bladder is empty, the epithelial layer seems to be cuboidal in nature, right? Something, something like that. But when your bladder's full, it's stretched out, and so it turns into a layer of simple squamous epithelium. How cool is that? Okay. All right, so here is your kind of quiz. I want you to tell me what kind of epithelial tissue we're looking at. So if you look at this, you're like, okay, seems to be a cross-section, right? I'm looking kind of down on these cells. 
and notice they're really, really tight together. But because you kind of just see this one layer of cells there, this happens to be simple. If it's simple and it looks like this, it is simple squamous. Flat and one layer. Okay, so that is simple squamous epithelium. Let's check this one out. Okay, this is a, a micrograph from alveoli, which are in your lungs. Turns out, so all this stuff here in the middle is lumen, right? This is all space. This is inside the sacs of your alveoli. But the epithelial layer um, separating the different parts of these alveoli, this is one cell layer thick, and you're looking, in this case, from a longitudinal section. So this is still simple squamous. Okay, so this is simple squamous epithelium. Sorry for the writing there. I gotta get used to this pen. Squamous. Okay, so simple squamous epithelium. Now look at this one. Ah, very interesting. So let's look at the, and remember that there's more than one kind of thing in a micrograph. So all of this stuff down here is actually connective tissue. I'll put CT for connective tissue. The actual cell layer, epithelial cell layer, starts up here. So if you look up here, notice these guys are all kind of this flat shape. So these are squamous cells, but there's multiple layers of them. So this is stratified, stratified squamous. Okay, so that's stratified squamous epithelium. Okay, so stratified squamous epithelium. Ah, what about this one? You're like, okay, let's look at it. All these nuclei are about the same height, and you know they're all touching that that basement membrane here. So let's let's highlight that basement membrane. Okay, and each cell is a column shape. So you guessed it. This is simple columnar epithelium. Simple columnar epithelium. Or columnar epithelium. Okay, versus this one. All of these guys, if you look even, so let's take that guy. He does touch the basal membrane there, the basement membrane. So does this guy right here. He touches the basement membrane. So they all touch the basement membrane, but they do not all reach the apical surface. So therefore, this is, dun dun dun, See if I can write this properly. Pseudo stratified by columnar epithelium. Now, not only is this one pseudo stratified columnar epithelium, it gets even more complicated. Notice all the cilia up at the top. So the proper name for this guy is actually the name for this guy is actually ciliated. Pseudostratified, pseudostratified. Just trust me, it says pseudostratified um, columnar, columnar epithelium, epithelium. Boy, this pen's hard to work with. Ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium has cilia. It's pseudostratified because they all touch the basement membrane but don't all touch the apical surface. And it's column-shaped cells, so it's columnar, and of course it's an epithelium. Okay, what about this one? Dun, dun, dun. First of all, let's label the lumen. Here's a lumen, lumen, there's a lumen, lumen. Okay, so those are our lumen. Well, notice the shape of these cells here. So obviously this is a cube-shaped cell, and one of the ways to tell that it's a cube-shaped cell is the nucleus is huge. So in cube, cuboidal cells, it tends to be very large nuclei. That's kind of your first um, giveaway. And notice that this is some kind of tubing that we're looking at, cross-section, so probably tissue where there's a lot of tube all kind of convoluted together. And um, notice that these guys all touch the same layer here and they're only one cell layer thick so the lumen is actually over here would be the apical surface of these guys 
Okay, so one cell layer thick, cuboidal cells, therefore we have simple cuboidal epithelium. Simple cuboidal epithelium. Check this out. Uh, this is from a site at University of Michigan uh, Medical School. And if you just Google University of Michigan epithelial tissue, you'll get it. Um, or I will provide this link for you. Um, this is so cool. This is an interactive website where you can actually look at all sorts of different slides of epithelial tissue and learn where those, um, that tissue is from, what part of the body, and what kind of epithelial tissue you're dealing with. So, uh, for example, if you scroll down and we say, okay, let's look at some simple epithelial uh, examples, um, you know, we can click here. It's a small intestine. So if you click it, it'll open up a slide of um, a histology slide of the small intestine. So you might have to wait for a minute. And how cool is this? It's like a virtual microscope. So what it, the first thing it's going to show you is a zoomed out picture of small intestine. So this is a cross section of the small intestine here. And if I take my ink, this will let me draw right on here. So what I'm outlining right now is the lumen inside your small intestine. And of course, I mean, this is your whole intestine. So this is a big tube and the inside is, is a space because that's where, you know, all the crud that's going through there goes through. And again, notice that this is kind of flattened and that means that this person has a nice emptied small intestine. There's no food being digested in here. If there was a big, chunk of food coming through there, then this would be nice and circular, but, uh, but it's flat. Now, remember that epithelial tissue likes to line the lumen, and it also likes to line the outside of the organ. So we are going to know that there's actually, if I click back on my pen here, we're going to know that there's also an epithelial layer surrounding the intestine itself. So I'm just going to loosely draw around this to point out, you know, some places to look for epithelial tissue. So when you're, um, notice this is zoomed out. So this is um, at very low magnification. So this might be at like um, 4x objective or 10x objective that you're looking at. Actually, it says here 40x, so uh, 4x objective. Now, when um, you're looking for an epithelial tissue layer to identify, you obviously, this is too small. You can't identify what kind of epithelial tissues are there. So we have to go at higher and higher magnification to actually see the epithelial tissue layer. So you're going to want to go to 400 total, you know, which is the 40x objective, or in some cases even oil immersion. Um, so when you're given a slide, like in lab, and you're asked to identify what kind of epithelial tissue it is, keep in mind you want to look near spaces. Epithelial tissue lines lumen and it lines the exterior surface here. So let's go over here, check out how cool this is. If you go over here and you slide down, woo, it's actually zooming in on this. And depending on how fast your internet speed is, it could take a while to look clear. My internet is deciding to be very slow tonight, but check it out. We zoomed in even more here and notice I'm, I'm at the lumen. So notice that some things start to become apparent, but I'm still not actually able to identify the epithelial tissue layer because all of these little cells lining these little nooks and crannies, that's epithelial tissue. So I want to go even more. So let's, let's go up to 10x and let's um, move this guy around. Ah, it's becoming a little clearer, isn't it? Here is my epithelial tissue layer. So let's, let's draw that again. So I'm going to outline the epithelial tissue layer. It's right there. How beautiful is that? Let me go back to my pen again. There we go. So notice that in here we are at the lumen. Okay, so in here is the lumen, but here is your epithelial tissue layer. And you probably can already identify what kind of epithelial tissue type that is, but let's go up even more just to make sure. So now I zoomed in even more. <laughs> now you can see that my line was not very well drawn. But check it out. I mean, let's outline one of those cells. Check it out. Look. Well, that looks to me like a column. So that is columnar. And so we say, okay, it's columnar. But now let's look at 
how this guy's arranged. And you can see when you get over here, these guys actually are not really pseudostratified. These guys all kind of are at the same level um, on the basal membrane. And so these guys are um, simple columnar epithelium. Now, while I'm at it, let's point out some other cool things stuck in here. Check out this guy right here. And this guy right here. Oops. I'm gonna hit the pen again. Check out that guy right there. You guys remember what that is? That is, of course you do. That is a goblet cell, right? So let's let's label that guy. That is a goblet cell. Always, every time I pick my pen up, I have to hit the thing again. Goblet cell. Cross my T. Cross my T. Okay, so that is a goblet cell. And what's the function of goblet cells? Produces mucus. So as those goblet cells are producing the mucin, which is mucus when combined with water, it oozes out into the lumen and coats the epithelial layer here. So that stuff slides really nice. How cool is that? Okay, now let's go back to AP Revealed for a sec and click on the histology, the little microscope thing here, and go to all content. And now you can select different types of epithelial tissue to look at and kind of quiz yourself. If you click on these different things, you know, you can say, okay, let's highlight an example of an epi cuboidal epithelial cell. Okay, so here's a cuboidal epithelial cell and you can read about it. Uh, let's highlight the lumen. So you can see in here is the lumen um, and the general whole simple cuboidal epithelium is along here and um, a tangential section that means so when these tissues are they're making the specimen the slide you know the tissue is three-dimensional and so while they might get a nice flat looking layer here the other side might be folded a little bit and so you're kind of looking at a different section um, up here which is why it doesn't look exactly like that and um, let's click on a uh, simple columnar here we go. And, you know, you can even go down here and hit tags. We can say, okay, what is the name of this? Dun, 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 dun. Obviously, that is the lumen. And we're actually looking at a uterine tube here, which is pretty cool. So you can see that simple columnar epithelium is what uterine tubes, fallopian tubes, are made of. Here would be an example of a single columnar epithelium cell. And uh, notice up here that this layer of simple columnar is also lined with cilia and if you know anything about uterine tubes fallopian tubes those cilia are really important they beat back and forth and that helps to get an egg moving down the path so really important so this the full name of this would be ciliated simple columnar epithelium and notice even though the nuclei are in different places these guys are all have the same apical surface and the same basal surface so anyway practice looking at these um, and oh almost forgot so when you're talking about stratified squamous now I, I mentioned stratified squamous is for example what you'll find on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet so it serves a protective layer well here is um, what we call non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium so if we uh, you know look at um, the epithelium here. So this, all of this is the stratified squamous epithelium. So just tons and tons of layers of these squamous cells. Um, if you look down here, this is where all of that connective tissue is. So that this is the, the connective tissue. Um, the fancy name for the connective tissue area is the lamina propria. Okay, so lamina propria is where all the connective tissue is. Um, and a single squamous cell would look like this little guy right here and its nucleus. You guys obviously know where that is. There's this nucleus. Um, but some stratified squamous cells, um, stratified squamous tissue, doesn't need as much protection, and so it does not produce a proteinous subject, um, substance. It does not produce keratin um, after the cells die, and so it's called non-keratinized. But if we contrast that to keratinized, So if we contrast that to keratinized, like you find, for example, you know, when you get those corns on your hands, um, what happens is as the cells mature, they go from the basal membrane area up through and they just kind of migrate on up. And you'll learn this when we go over the integumentary system. 
And as they get older, they start dying and they start producing the protein keratin. And you know, like your hair is made of keratin, right? It's basically dead cells produce keratin. And that keratin builds up and it gives it this nice keratinized layer. Okay, so, um, so that is a keratinized squam stratified squamous epithelium. Okay, so you get the idea. Great study tool. Play around with it. Let's check out some pseudostratified while we're at it. So here's a nice pseudostratified. Notice they're not all touching the apical surface. This is ciliated pseudostratified epithelium. And uh, let's see. So anyway, um, here's a transitional epithelium. So again, the shapes of these will change depending on whether the tissue is stretched or not almost done talking about epithelial tissue and then we'll talk about connective tissue in the next uh, little video so now recall that epithelial tissue lines spaces so it lines the lumen or it lines the space outside of the tissue that you're talking about the structure outside of the blood vessel for example now um, that epithelial uh, tissue layer in some cases actually kind of folds in on itself to produce a gland. Now you've heard of glands before. You're like, okay, I'm sick, uh, fill my glands. Well, in actuality, a true gland has a particular function. And remember that we talked about epithelial cells. You know, I drew one that looks like this. And we said epithelial cells serve a number of functions, including secretory functions. Secretory, secretory. Secretory, that says secretory. Secretory functions, meaning it can produce products such as mucin, and that mucin can go outside of the cell. So it secretes a particular substance. So glands have a secretory function. But, you know, we've been talking a lot about mucin because I just think it's such a cool substance, actually, for things that have to happen in our body. And uh, you can see goblet cells, which are just amazing. But mucin is only one kind of secretion that gland cells can produce. They also produce hormones. You like oh, hormones, testosterone, estrogen, you know, there are so many hormones in your body and it could be argued that a personality is really a product of your hormones. You know, you have a bad day, you're stressed, well, your stress hormones are up, etc. Well, hormones are secreted by glands. Other proteins called enzymes are secreted by glands, and we already know that waste products are secreted by glands. So we have here a picture. I'm going to outline the outside of it. This is a picture of a gland. And so notice, you know, you got your epithelial layer here. We, we see the epithelial layer, and you'll be able to identify, especially if you zoom in, you'll be able to identify what kind of epithelial layer here is. And this is our lumen. So this is a gland, and glands can be embedded into your skin, but some glands actually are big, and they're kind of like organs. Like your pancreas could be considered a gland um, because, or have glands in it because it produces hormones. Now, there's two categories for these kinds of glands, depending on how they do their secretions. So the first type is called an endocrine gland endocrine gland and you know that the prefix endo means inside endo inside um, versus the other kind is called an exocrine gland and you know that the prefix exo means on the outside so this kind of gives you a clue of how we categorize these glands endocrine glands are glands that are going to secrete their secretions inside of the body or inside of that particular area and exocrine glands secrete their secretions, in most cases, outside of the body. So um, here is another way you can kind of tell these guys apart. Uh, endocrine glands have no ducts. So uh, for example, you have um, epithelial layers inside of, just say for example, the testicles. And those are going to secrete testosterone. Now um, testosterone, is a hormone and it's secreted directly into the bloodstream and so because it's secreting the hormone directly into the bloodstream it's an endocrine gland or think of your pituitary gland in your brain and it as you'll learn later does so many functions produces so many different kinds of hormones and 
boom, put out in the bloodstream. Therefore, it's an endocrine gland because it's being secreted inside of the body. And so it doesn't need any ducts to do that. It doesn't need any little pathways. So if you look at this picture right here, if you can see this, um, what we have here is um, the opposite of an endocrine gland. This is an exocrine gland because it has a duct. See how, like here's the gland, here's the epithelial layer, and just see how that's a little duct. So all the secretions travel through this duct and outside of the body. Whereas if you take an endocrine gland, like um, here for example, Here's actually an endocrine gland. These cells are going to produce their secretion that then goes directly into the bloodstream and circulate through the body. So no, there's no duct. There's nothing, there's no duct here. So nothing coming out of the cell, out of the tissue or out of the body. Um, so endocrine glands, they have no ducts. Instead, they secrete directly into the blood or into the fluid that's not blood, it's kind of floating between the cells. You'll hear this term a lot. We call this interstitial fluid. Say that with me. Interstitial fluid is the fluid, it's usually watery, that surrounds cells, tissues. Now, exocrine glands do possess ducts. So that's this guy right here, right? So exocrine glands secrete their secretions outside of the body. So your sweat glands, the um, sebaceous glands, like the oil glands, um, you know, secrete oil on your scalp, you know, you haven't washed your hair for a couple days and it gets all gritty. Well, that's because that uh, icky oil is kind of going through the ducts and outside onto your scalp. Uh, what else? Um, you know, actually the pancreas can have a, an exocrine function. It's considered um, its digestive hormones that it's producing actually transfer to the digestive system so it's going outside of that local region, and so that's considered an exocrine gland. Um, lacrimal glands. Lacrimal, as you'll learn later when we study bones, you have a lacrimal bone on either side of your tear ducts here. Lacrimal, it means tears in Latin. And so um, where do your tears come from? Well, you actually have cells in lacrimal glands that will secrete tears. And, and those are exocrine. They have ducts your tear ducts, and then the tears come pouring out because you've had a bad day, hopefully not from, you know, after an A and P test. Um, so sebaceous is going to secrete oily substances. Uh, sweat glands, obviously, secrete sweat. Boy, that does not look like it says oil. And lacrimal glands secrete tears. Um, another one, uh, milk glands. Yeah, so breast tissue has milk glands, and if you're a lactating woman, you are able to have your epithelial cells surrounding your milk glands will produce milk. And it's, exo it's exocrine because that milk will travel through your milk ducts and outside of the body to the baby. Okay, so enough about glands. Uh, that will conclude this first part of the lecture, and then we will go on to connective tissue in the next segment. Thanks for joining.